My name is Kale. I'm a filmmaker and a surfer, and I'm searching for the greatest shortboard in the world. In order for me to do that, I need lots of boards and I need lots of waves. So I've partnered with Urban Surf in Melbourne to ask some of the top surfboard brands in the world, plus a few wildcards, to send me their best off-the-shelf publicly available surfboard to rip into in the consistent, reliable playground that is the Urban Surf Wave Pool. Twelve boards over five days will be whittled down to three finalists, which I'm going to take away and ride for a month before deciding a winner. Most importantly, I only get to keep two of the boards, whilst the rest will stay on at Urban Surf in the higher fleet. Now this means I have to choose very carefully. I'm going to adhere to some standard measurements in each board, which are actually relevant to the everyday surfer. This is the search for the greatest surfboard on earth. One. Two. But I think everybody sort of watched Stab in the Dark uh, and loved it. I love it. Uh, I think there's some obvious shortcomings with Stab in the Dark. First being that a lot of the boards are custom shapes, so they're not actually available to the everyday surfer. Second of all, I think they often, they always use professional surfers who are so far above any of us everyday surfers. So that's why we're doing this. I want to take all the off the shelf boards and try them out as an everyday surfer and see which one surfs the best. Super simple. Running a test like this isn't easy, or cheap for that matter. I wanted things standardized as much as possible, which is why using Urban Surf as our battleground made a lot of sense. A surfer's response to a board can be highly influenced by the type of waves they get to test them in, and even then the waves they get in that specific session. Additionally, I'll be using FCS2 performers in each of the boards, with some obvious variations for our twin fins, to accurately measure board performance. Okay, a little behind the scenes. With the behemoth weight of the wave pool behind me, I was able to convince each board company to donate their best off-the-shelf surfboards to the test, free of charge, and with no extra cost involved. I've got 12 sessions locked in at the pool over the next two days, including five of the new advanced turn settings, which has quickly become my favourite. I'm also doing the advanced and intermediate settings, which provide a whackable wall as well. In today's episode, I'm ripping into the first four boards that have arrived. First up are the Chili Surfboards BV2 and the long-awaited Neckbeard 3 from Channel Islands. So this one might have already been opened because I was particularly excited about this one. Wow. So this is a Neckbeard 3, Dane Reynolds um, driven model. Dims on this one, 5.7. 19 and 1 8, 2 and 3 8, neck bit 3, 28.1 litres. So that's pretty much smack bang on what I'd normally ride volume wise. Maybe a little bit over. Some new spine tech. So you notice a big thing, they used to do all the, all those um, neck beards with like a sawn off tail, right? This one though, rounded. A little bit more forgiving maybe. A little bit more balanced, we'll see. I have ridden a neck bit before and loved it. I'm so keen to get on this thing. This is Christmas, isn't it? I remember when I was a grommet, <laughs> I used to buy new boards and uh, new boards being like secondhand boards. 
and I used to like sleep with them in my room <laughs> right next to the bed so I could wake up and look at them. BB2, chili, hot pink rails, haven't seen those for a while. <laughs> oh wow. Dim's on this one, 5'8", 19 and a half, 2 and 7 sixteenths, 29 litres on that. It's quite, I mean, it's a lot bigger than I'd normally ride from a literage perspective. But it doesn't feel that way under arm. It's actually, it's kind of nice and feels short. But I think that's just because it's like girthy. It's got nice breadth in it. Oh, I look forward to getting on this thing. It looks sharp. Super sharp. The BV2 was designed, in Chili's words, for summer. A small to medium sized wave board with a pretty forgiving shape, it can be ridden as a thruster, which is what I'm riding it as, or a 2 plus 1, which apparently loosens it up a little. The first thing I noticed jumping on it is how well it paddles, making it a wave catching machine for the everyday surfer. I liked it. I'm keen to try that beforehand. Yeah. Get out of the next one. The highly anticipated update to arguably one of the world's most famous pro surfer board lines, the Neckbeard by Dane Reynolds and Channel Islands. The Neckbeard 3 is only different from its predecessor, the Neckbeard 2, in the tail. The rounded shape is intended to provide smoother transitions in the pocket, more hold overall and a potentially more forgiving experience, making it more relevant perhaps for the everyday surfer. Now, I've ridden a Neckbeard 2 before and I loved it. This board, though, seems a little slower than the original, which really makes me appreciate how much the tail of a board can impact its performance. Cool, so I really enjoyed 
this. I felt like it had some really special moments. I could, when I, when I sunk into it and pushed it, I felt like the board responded better. If I nursed it, it didn't respond that well. The only sort of thing I felt like I was struggling with consistently was transitioning rail to rail at the bottom of the way. So after I went up and did a wrap, I tried to sort of transition straight into another manoeuvre and I couldn't quite catch it on any of the ways. Um, it's pretty standard to feel a little, little bit jittery on the first session. And I did, it did take a little while to get used to. It felt stiff originally, but I think that's because I was being light footed. Again, as soon as I sort of sunk into it a little bit more, I felt like it responded really nicely. It doesn't feel like a typical small wave board, even though the shape seems that way. It um, feels like it would really appreciate like those steeper pockets. Uh, so I really want to give that another go on my forehand, actually. We'll see how it goes. I, I really liked it. So the neck bid three felt pretty nice. It felt really predictable. There wasn't anything surprising about it. It just kind of wanted to turn wherever you wanted to go. And I think that's what you want out of a smaller wave board. It definitely felt like a smaller wave board. Like even though this is a 5.7 and I think the chili is a 5.8. Five, five, the neck beard felt like it was like two inches shorter or three inches shorter. It surfed that way. Just a little bit more whippy. Um, not as like, it didn't have that solid foundation that I feel like the chili had in terms of like being able to drive off the bottom. Definitely like through the inside, after you sort of were able to connect on the first wrap, then you could sort of whip it a little bit harder. I feel like this one you could really push and it would just respond quite nicely. It feels like a small wave board. Small wave board, what are you looking for? Predictability, floatiness, responsiveness, uh, and a little bit of drive, and it certainly had all those things. Couple of compressions already though. Productive morning. I think they've literally given me a black board. <laughs> I can't get it out. That's so sharp. There we go. Wow. Oh, it looks gnarly black, hey? Reminds me of Point Break. <laughs> well, it's sharp. First, that's it's a lot sharp. Well, sharp eye, right? It's a lot sharper, more performancey than I'd normally ride, I'm not gonna lie. So dims on this one, five, nine, 19 and a quarter, two and a half. Uh, comes in 27.9 liters. Inferno 72. So this one's not actually out publicly at the time of filming. God, they did a quick job in it. There we go. Slater Designs, Firewire, Flat Earth, Aquila Aper, is that how you say that? I mean the most distinct thing about this board obviously is this like sort of width here which makes it feel like a normal surfboard like, but like a bigger one and then there's these big chunks out of the tail there. So I don't know what that pulled in tail would do to it. I rode a sci-fi once and I really didn't like it at all. But this thing looks pretty cool. Dims on this one, five, seven, 19 and a half, two and a half, 28.4 liters. So again, it's a little bit higher than I'd normally ride. Maybe, holy sh everyone's trying to tell me something. <laughs> oh, I mean, this is sick.
Inferno 72 wasn't publicly ready when we filmed this test, so I have no info on it from the team at all. All I can say is this is the most high performance shape I've jumped on in a while, and happily, the thing just flies. There seems to be some magic right between the feet which propels the board forward out of a bottom turn and makes manoeuvres feel a little crazy and overwhelming but totally workable. There are a few moments I've experienced where a board just felt easy and ultra high performance the first time I rode it. This is one of them. A collaboration between Aquila Aper and Kelly Slater, this Slater Designs board is designed as a go-to shape all year round for ankle high waves to overhead waves. There was a lot of pressure to ride this one as a 2 plus 1, which I eventually did, and you'll see that later on, but I wanted to feel out the board naturally with a balanced thruster setup to start with. I must say, I've never had a board feel so different when surfing at horizontal versus surfing at vertical. When I was trying to power through wraps on the open face, it didn't quite feel like it was giving anything back, but as soon as I started surfing a little softer, at about 80% intensity and going more vertical, the thing seemed to come alive underfoot and became quite an effortless experience. Four boards off the rank are all pretty sick. I think straight off the bat though, like the sharp eye really stood out. Uh, I think I said before I went out, this is again, not something I typically ride, but it just had so much drive. It was just so sick. It just wanted to sort of push and just, res it just responded. It just felt like it was just it was drivey. Drivey was the, the main word there. Uh, when I had it in the sweet spot, it was awesome. Um, there were a couple of moments I just couldn't find the sweet spot and then my turns were a little bit sort of average, sort of shitty. But once I got my foot right up against that tail pad kicker and then you could just feel the sweet spot, it was just like, uh, like a really nice oomph to it. Just, and, and it just felt effortless when you're in that zone. So that was sick and I definitely want to get back on that. Um, next in line, I'd probably go between these two, the Flat Earth or the BB2. This one was sick. I mean, as you guys heard me say before, it was really zippy, super responsive, like crazy responsive, almost over responsive. I had to surf at 80% on this one. Um, really, really nice. The CI 
The Neckbeard 3, probably the board I was most excited about riding, was probably the least impressive initially. Right now, the Sharp Eye is definitely winning, which, you know, it could be a little bit awkward because <laughs> they've just won Stab in the Dark, obviously. Um, but we'll see. I think getting these guys in some different waves is going to be pretty cool too. Anyway, massive day tomorrow. Let's wrap up. On the next episode, I get a fresh batch of boards for testing in the pool. A particularly surprising 20 that doesn't surf like a 20 at all. A world champion inspired shape. And a big letdown from one of the boards. It's the only board that I've just gone like halfway through a session. Nah, this is not working. And I'm still chasing up a last minute wild card. Oh, hi, I'm just um, chasing up I uh, think Simon. Uh, but it's still not here. We're in Tullamarine. But the board we were after has not arrived. I'll see you next week. Thank you.